getting texts that people are having a hard time getting in. I will okay. resend the confirmation email and we are live on Facebook. Great. So good morning. Thank you all for joining us. I know um, this is a little, we're delayed an hour um, from our normal time. So those of you who are having a hard time getting in, we are resending uh, the invite. Hopefully you can get in. Um, it, this is Representative Maxine Dexter. I'm very excited to have um, Superintendent Guadalupe Guerrero with us this morning, as well as Dr. Sean Bird. And we are going to be focusing on um, school reopening. And so I will talk about uh, vaccines probably farther down when it's time relevant to what we're uh, discussing as far as school reopening. But um, I want to just hand this off to our guests from PPS and, and let them um, really run the show today. So Dr. Bird, if you'll introduce yourself and then we'll hand it off to the superintendent. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sean Bird. I'm the chief of schools for PPS, which means I support uh, school leadership and uh, school operations. And superintendent. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for having us. Uh, always good to see you, uh, Representative Dr. Dexter, and always enjoy uh, chatting with you about what's the latest in public ed uh, and particularly here in the Portland Public Schools. Uh, thanks for, for making some space this morning uh, on this dedicated topic. It's on all of our minds. It's been on all of our minds for a year because we've all been living with it. Uh, and as I was sharing in an all staff message yesterday, uh, it's been quite a year. Uh, initially, we thought this might be an extended spring break uh, around this time. Uh, we didn't really know uh, what this pandemic was all about. Uh, I think there were a lot of unknowns a year ago uh, about understanding it and what it would mean for communities. And uh, I think we've come a long way in better understanding the science behind it all. Um, and so we thought it was prudent at that time to uh, and, and, and in collaboration with our peers up and down the state that, that perhaps we should close schools uh, so we can get our arms around uh, what this all means. Uh, and as I think people recall, state leadership felt the same way uh, that we were starting to see that this pandemic was underway. And so, uh, you know, we have spent uh, the last year uh, and, uh, as educators, uh, and I'll underline that as educators, not as ep epidemiologists, um, to actually, you know, inform ourselves and receive sort of the best recommendations and guidance that we can um, from health experts, from uh, folks who uh, are, we're relying on to provide us with the information that we need to make responsible decisions about how do we maintain a continuity of learn, learning for our students. And that's always been, you know, our primary concern is how do we keep an educational program moving for students, uh, whether it's on campus or an entirely new way of playing school, in this case, virtually. Uh, and so there were a few things we needed to do really quickly, and, and that's to ensure that there are some access barriers immediately resolved. Uh, that's why we mobilized and tens of thousands of laptops, uh, we had to quickly uh, distribute those to all of our students. And because there are digital divides in this community uh, to make sure if they needed that they also had Wi-Fi, internet uh, connectivity, uh, hotspots. And so that, that was a, a primary concern. The other was, so many of our students rely on the nutrition that Portland Public Schools provide. So we also had to have a solution for getting meals uh, to our families to make sure that our students were, were taken care of. So those were a couple of initial things that we needed to, to take care of. And in the meantime, we had to sort of rethink and reimagine. I know that's the title of our vision, but we really had to be uh, creative and thinking about, well, how do we deliver instruction? How do we ensure learning continues? And at that time, if you recall, we went from closure to thinking through, well, what does a comprehensive distance learning model look? And as we consulted with colleagues from around the country, challenged with these same questions. In fact, that's where I was this past hour, sort of doing a status check with some of the bigger districts around the country uh, who were all wrestling with the same questions. Um, we, were, we were able to arrive at a model that uh, allowed our, our, our educators through new learning platforms, new technology software to provide direct instruction to, to students at home. Now, 
public education as a model hasn't changed a whole lot in hundreds of years. So this was, uh, you know, if you if you really reflect on it, a, a, a supremely disruptive uh, to to the model of of education as we've all known it and grew up with. Um, and so in some ways, you know, there's also been some gains in this pandemic about what we've learned that technology can be an important tool. Uh, our students, our, our teachers have learned how to maximize those tools. Our students have learned to sort of uh, em engage in their learning through the use of, of technology. So we went through this period of comprehensive distance learning. And as we pushed for clarity around metrics and recommendations for how to begin thinking about when would be the appropriate time for reopening schools or to what extent and what precautions we would need to have in place, we began to think about what a limited in-person instruction model might look like. And so at that point, you know, there, were, there was clarity around metrics and what mitigation efforts would need to be in place in our schools. Uh, and so we've worked for months uh, to try to make sure that uh, all of those components are, are in place. Uh, so that includes, you know, maximizing air ventilation, uh, filtration and air quality in our buildings. So we put a lot of attention into, you know, inventorying all of our HVAC systems and all of our buildings. It's important that the teaching and learning environment is as safe and as healthy as possible. Now, if you're in a, one of our brand new modernized buildings, thank you to the voters of Portland, you're in pretty good shape but the vast majority of our schools you know are 80 plus years old and so uh where we could uh there was certainly a, a lot of cleaning and replacing of you know higher grade filtration but we we felt like we needed to take a step further uh on that because not all learning spaces uh, you know have have the best air circulation or uh and so we we also made a choice to invest thank goodness to covid relief federal monies coming to the district in air purifier units. And uh, we've made a commitment to continue deploying those to every single space across the school district where teachers or, or students uh, are, are, are going to be engaging in learning. Uh, the other uh, was you know, a real need to be clear about what new health and safety protocols all of our schools are gonna need to adopt. Uh, and so we need to sort of really create a new set of standard, standard operating procedures, which we've done. And we needed to make sure and make sure that everybody understood those new routines that, that they will be prepared to teach our students uh, how, to, how to engage in those new routines. So things like making sure that there were protective barriers and plexiglass and directional signage and, uh, uh, and a couple of other features that I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, it, it's a new way of uh, playing school or being on campus. And, and there's some important constraints that come with those health and safety uh, precautions, primarily social distancing or physical distancing. And that's a real key variable to uh, or constraint to how many students we can have in any particular classroom space or what numbers of, of students we can have at campus on any one time or how many on the bus or how many other people that a student or a teacher can come into contact with. So that, that's a, a really big variable that districts everywhere have had to contend with and districts in this state uh, in, in really uh, making sure we were compliant with Oregon Department of Ed guidelines. So we've had some opportunity over the last couple months, in some cases, some schools since February, early March, where limited numbers of students have been able to return to campus, especially students who really needed the face-to-face -face instruction. So we have examples, uh, initially just a few schools, and now just about the majority of schools, uh, as of last week, had opportunities where kids were coming on campus and educators were providing face-to-face -face, uh, instruction. So uh, in the meantime, distance learning has been continuing, has not skipped a beat every day. Uh, so students have been seeing their teachers, uh, their specials, their elective teachers uh, as best as possible. Uh, we acknowledge that our educators have required additional preparation time uh, to be prepared to uh, adapt all their lessons to meet students' needs uh, through a remote model. And now we're coming to a situation where uh, conditions have improved. The metrics indicate that uh, it is uh, more feasible, more viable to, to return students to a fuller reopening. Uh, so we're, we are in fact moving to a hybrid model of in-person. And I just have to remind people hybrid means a combination of in-person and continued virtual. 
uh, Oregon requirements don't stipulate what percentage of the time should be in person, uh, but some combination of that. The other thing that was important, and I think it's probably um, central to our conversation this morning, there's very strong viewpoints and opinions about what school systems should be doing, how fully reopen or, or, or how fully closed we should remain. And it, it really isn't you know, our job to sort of decide that for parents or families. Uh, our, our best thinking was to try to afford that, those options or, or those choices to our parents. And what we know from, from surveying our families is that about two thirds of them say, we're ready to come back to school to some extent. Uh, a third of our families felt pretty strongly, we're not coming back this spring. Uh, and so creating a, a hybrid model that accommodated for uh, families' choices uh, and still maintained a continuity of learning for students, ideally with the teacher they've been working with all year, you start to understand the complexity of, of putting forth a model uh, that preserves you know, the student-teacher relationship as well as tries to maximize students on campus engaging in face-to-face -face instruction while also meeting all the requirements around physical distancing and, and cohorting. Now, the rules continue to change throughout the course of this school year. And so, you know, one thing that I know my peer superintendents in the state and I sort of share is a, a constant sort of need to digest uh, revised uh, guidelines along the way. So when you're changing sort of the goalposts on a frequent basis, it gets a little challenging because school districts can't turn on a dime. And it, 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 we, we spent weeks, months, in some um, instances coming to some agreements or, or sort of re-engineering how we will play school. Uh, and then you know, sort of the rug gets pulled under and, and you have to sort of rethink that. Uh, and it can't happen overnight. Uh, and I'm sure people will, will really have a lot of questions around uh, recent announcements the CDC has made. So, uh, and we can get into that. Uh, and so I'll just say sort of that, that's been our context. Uh, I'm, I'm appreciative for uh, a staff that's been working nonstop for the last year. Uh, all of our labor partners, remember, we can't make these decisions unilaterally. We have multiple labor employee groups that we have to collaborate with and arrive at working condition agreements. Uh, I think everybody uh, shares the objective of getting our students safely back to school, but we're also an employer. We also have to keep close to 9,000 of our employees feeling uh, safe and, and prepared to, to do their work. Some of our employees have never stopped working on campus uh, with all the precautions, our custodians. You know, I think our buildings are as clean as they've ever been because they've had a lot of time on campus um, to go around and, and give our buildings the deep cleanings that, that, they, that were long overdue. Our, our nutrition service workers, they haven't stopped every day feeding our students and preparing meals. Our bus drivers, we did our best to keep as many of those employed. How? Delivering materials, delivering door-to-door -door, uh, lunches to, to our students. So we're really thankful for a lot of the dedication that, that our employees have demonstrated. And this past couple of weeks, um, our school principals, we, we have a general format for how we're going to implement a hybrid model of instruction, but it really boils down to, and I'll, this is the last thing I'll sort of lead with, each school community has to devise a specifically tailored plan for hybrid, because within that school community, Families will have a variety of sort of choices or, or that they've elected to make. In some schools, it's two thirds, one third. In other schools, it might be 50-50. So a principal working with their supervisor really has to look carefully at those numbers and try to adjust the staffing to, to maintain that student teacher uh, relationship wherever possible. And within the faculty, uh, think about how assignments might cover those that wanna choose stay in distance learning and those that wanna come in person. So, uh, and all of that has been getting worked out in real time and even as we speak. Um, so we're, we're really pleased to have arrived at this tentative agreement uh, ratified by our teachers union and, and uh, approved by our board this past Thursday night. Uh, so, so the team is working hard uh, to be ready for what we've announced to be uh, a return to, to schools for our youngest scholars first, pre-K Head Start, grade, uh, kindergarten and grade one on April 1st or April 2nd, depending which group you're in. Uh, in most cases, our students are being divided up into either AM groups or PM groups. Why, how come? Because you, you need time in between those sessions to 
redouble up all the bus routes to get the other half of the students in there. You need time in between the sessions to disinfect every student's workspace um, and a number of things that need to happen. Uh, we, we have to limit interaction among students. So we're providing grab and go meals as they walk out the door. Um, so it's all of these details that, that you have to work through that I hope people understand why you can't just kind of turn on a dime when, when the rules change. And on April 5th, we'll welcome back all of our grade two through five students. Uh, happy day. Uh, we're especially excited for our kindergartners because they've never been in school. So it's really their first day on the first or the second and everybody on the second through the fifth. Um, and then we'll have our older students grades six through 12 uh, starting to come in. Uh, there'll be many more details and individual student schedules that will get uh, updated for, for our families. So there's a, there's a lot of continued work uh, uh, going on uh, uh, that, that continues to be shared out. Hopefully folks have seen much more of a communication blitz uh, hitting the airwaves so that there's clarity as we've landed on these agreements. Uh, so everybody knows how Portland Public Schools is moving into its next phase, hybrid uh, in-person instruction. Uh, it's my hope, uh, my expectation in many ways, uh, that this helps set the stage for rehearsing and getting used to all these new health and safety practices. Uh, we're excited and looking forward to a lot of extended learning and an array of summer programming for our students. Uh, we really have a strong desire to re-engage our, our students, our families into all kinds of activities. Uh, and then we hope to, to do a full traditional reopening uh, this coming fall, but just before Labor Day. So that's the goal that we're working towards. We're hoping conditions continue to improve that in fact, guidelines do get revised between now and August uh, so that we can engage in all the planning that needs to happen to, to have a fuller reopening come fall. Great, thank you so much. And I just wanna first say how grateful I am for, and my son's just getting back from baseball practice, so it'll be a little loud here, but um, how grateful I am for how thoughtful PPS has been. And I know that it's been an unthank or a thankless um, sort of um, journey. And yet I really applaud how resilient and um, sustained your communication efforts have been. So, um, and this is being just yet another example of it. I do wanna mention because of your your point about um, getting kids fully back into school in the fall. Hey, you guys, I'm doing Facebook Live. Rob, Rob, sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so I, I really wanna say that vaccines are key to keeping our schools open. And we know that the B117 variant is likely on the rise and, and we may very well have a surge coming. And yet the faster we can get our communities vaccinated, the better. Um, and that really is what the governor and, and our legislative um, body is, is thinking about in my COVID committee in particular. And so these are two endeavors that really are very intimately linked. And so um, I hope that PPS will continue Continue to keep me informed as well as, as we work through this to know just where are the barriers for especially for our multi-generational families and, and those who are English language learners that um, may not have easy access. So please, I, I see this as an ongoing conversation. And um, so I, I'm grateful again for your leadership. So with that, Peter, I'm going to hand off to you and, and ask you to kind of give us some of the questions. And, and then when appropriate, I'll do an update on where vaccines are later. Yeah, so we asked constituents to fill out a Google form in advance of the town hall, and we've kind of synthesized a lot of the main points. Of course, constituents have very similar questions. So we're going to ask from this list um, first, and then we're going to, uh, if we have time, take the questions that people are asking live. So one question that we had um, received a lot of questions about are what are the guidelines regarding uh, closing in-person slash hybrid classrooms if an outbreak does occur? Um, people are very worried about that. Yeah, that's an important question. Uh, and, and with all these questions, Dr. Bird and I will, will tag team um, uh, responses, but I, I will say that uh, Oregon Department of Ed and OHA ha have made clear many of the guidelines uh, around um, uh, how we should handle students or staff who show up asymptomatic, uh, what kind of testing regime should be in place, uh, what level of quarantining should happen, 
uh, if there's been contact uh, once we trace that. Uh, and we wanna be very observant of that as we've learned from other districts around the state and the country, sometimes it is necessary to quarantine the class, the grade level, a school sometimes. And uh, you know, we'll, we'll be monitoring that uh, very carefully. But do you wanna say a little bit more about this, Sean? Sure. So we also um, will be implementing the uh, testing uh, protocols for symptomatic students and staff members if they uh, do appear on our campuses with and display symptoms. Uh, the part of the model is that if we need to uh, close down a, a classroom, then those students can uh, easily go back into comprehensive distance learning because that's uh, in the elementary level. There are there's a morning and an afternoon class. We can easily uh, uh, return those students to comprehensive distance learning. The same with our middle and high schools. The middle and high school students will be receiving their uh, instruction just like they do right now in the morning. So it would be uh, fairly uh, uh, seamless to revert to uh, a distance learning uh, method if we needed to for the quarantine period. But there's guidelines that our staff are being trained on and uh, and there's protocols that we use in our schools to uh, to make those decisions and those will be available to families as, as we return to school. Great. Um, another question that we've received several times is um, asking what was the kind of rationale behind the current hybrid model. Some people are kind of comparing to other metro schools and, and found that uh, they thought that uh, PPS kind of had a, a lower amount of in-person school and they're just kind of wondering what went behind that decision-making process. Sure. So, you know, our goal is to uh, get students back into school, all the students who want to come into school uh, to be able to make that happen. We do have to comply with the physical distancing requirements, which does limit the amount of students we can get into a building at one time. So, for example, our high schools are uh, as small as 600, but as large as, as uh, nearly 2,000. So to, to uh, make those uh, classes work and to get the students in, uh, we can't have everybody coming every day, uh, you know, five days a week. And so we had to divide, and we wanted to make sure because we know that some uh, percentage of our students want to stay uh, home and uh, distance learning for a variety of reasons. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we could serve those students. And so in our elementary school, uh, you know, we chose a model that's uh, four days a week uh, for two hours and 15 minutes a day. And those uh, cohorts are divided AM and PM. But that's because we wanted students to be able to have a routine of seeing their uh, teacher uh, more frequently. We could have done a we could have done a, a you know two days, uh, two full days, but then there would have been several days in between where they wouldn't see a teacher. And that also poses other problems in terms of uh, serving food and how do you uh, do that with staffing. Um, their teachers are uh, are required to have a duty free lunch. So there there are lots of uh, complications in a full day model. Um, and also, uh, and, and so this model allows kids to come in in elementary school for uh, the foundational reading and math skills, which we think are very important for uh, students to uh, get into some routine, especially our youngest students with their teacher. And then they'll participate in some elements of distance learning that they're already used to. So it provides uh, some routine for kids that are they're already used to, and then introduces them back into the school environment for uh, direct instruction from their teachers for those most important uh, skills in elementary school. In high school and middle school, students will do exactly what they're doing right now in the morning. They'll have their classes online live with their teachers in the morning. And so if it's Monday, you're gonna go to your first and second period class. And then those students who choose to come in the afternoon will be able to, they'll be following their schedule. So they'll see their first and second period teacher uh, in the afternoon that they saw uh, they had class with in the morning. So there's a couple of advantages to that. The students that don't come in are not losing instruction. They're getting the instruction that, that, that everybody else is getting. And then those students who choose not to come in are gonna be working on applied learning activities. They're gonna be uh, doing uh, extending their learning. The students who do come in, the teacher will have an opportunity to uh, put those students, let them interact with one another in groups, uh, let them be able to intervene with certain students who may need additional help or accelerate students who uh, may need to, may have already grasped the concept and need to move on. But it will give them an opportunity to interact with the teacher. There'll be instruction. Um, we've heard some people have compared it to study hall. It's not a study hall. It is uh, opportunity for instruction from a teacher. And our teachers at the same time will be preparing for the instruction that they give to students in the morning that they always do. They'll be uh, preparing for asynchronous instruction for the students who are not coming in because we don't want those students to lose anything. And they'll be preparing for instruction for the students who are coming in live. So there's really three uh, different, different groups of uh, activities that our teachers will be preparing for. And so the students who don't come into school 
you know, that, that will allow the teacher, uh, the next, you know, when they see them in the morning, they can group students differently so that we're making sure there's equity in, in the delivery of instruction for our students. So maybe they'll be uh, grouped differently in the AM class with everybody together that's online. The teacher can group students differently so that they are um, ensuring that they're uh, um, able to grasp all of the concepts and understand and demonstrate mastery of the concepts. There's also the Wednesday that will allow teachers to meet and, and uh, have office hours for those students who are not coming into school to provide additional help. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that all of the students who are not coming in, in uh, whether it be elementary, middle or high school, are going to have opportunities to meet with their teachers. So that's why we had to do a, uh, sort of a, this, this model of half day uh, remaining in distance learning and half day uh, coming in, into the school for the students who wanted to. And middle and high school are very similar in that students in middle school will also uh, see all of their classes. So middle and high school students will be able to come two days a week and they'll see uh, half their classes on each day. And uh, there'll be two cohorts and that's because of the distancing requirements that are, that are in place. Can I just right. interject that this is a remarkable uh, puzzle that you have um, just elaborated on and, and I'm just grateful for the thought that's going into this, but also the teachers like I have a really um, increased appreciation for how challenging this is going to be and making sure everyone gets the attention they deserve. So um, for any teachers out there, I, I really do appreciate what this is looking like. And as a parent um, of a freshman who hasn't seen the inside of his high school yet, I, I really do appreciate that that in-person opportunity is there, um, even if it's limited, just because just going into that building and having a sense of place is really important. So thank you um, everyone for making that possible. And another question that we've received um, a lot of feedback on is, um, and it was lightly touched on, but how PPS will reflect CDC guidelines and ODE guidelines. The specific uh, kind of thing on the top of people's head is with the CDC's new recommendation for three feet versus six feet, they're wondering kind of how this will change or if it will change during this current school year um, and what plans are kind of for the fall with regard to CDC guidelines. Yeah, we all learned about that this Friday afternoon. So uh, what a positive development. <laughs> um, and every state has to absorb those new guidelines and recommendations, including Oregon. And so uh, it sounds like the governor has, has asked OHA and ODE, uh, you know, to sort of look at those and see what implications they may have uh, for creating additional flexibility and what implications they may have. Uh, so I think it, it gets us another step closer, you know, with a deeper understanding now after some time has gone by around what that means for schools or when you have large, larger numbers of students together. Um, so I think it's a step in the right direction and I think will lead to uh, assisting us with, with having a, a full reopening in the fall. But if CDC just made this announcement on Friday and now states have to digest that, and think about how to update and revise their guidelines. And that usually takes a little while. And then that has to be uh, shared with school districts. Uh, school districts then have to uh, look at the implications uh, that it may have for how we're playing school. And then we have to turn around and work with our array of labor partners around a change in working conditions. So for months, we've been relying on uh, the current guidelines that are in effect. Uh, and those are the ones we negotiated with. And so here in the Tri-County area, every other school district did similarly. At, the, at that time, there's a 35 square foot or six foot physical distancing requirement. And that's what we had to observe. So in all of our conversations, it, that was the understanding. And we did make agreements. If we're gonna change up the working conditions, then we agreed to come back to the table and have those conversations. I will tell you, we've been in perpetual bargaining for a year and for this hybrid in-person model for a few months. So if CDC just made revisions on announced on Friday and the state's got to look at their existing guidelines and then issue guidance to school districts, and then we all have to turn around and bargain those new working conditions or changes with our labor partners, that's not something that can be done overnight. And so uh, it, it, if, if we stop to do that right now, uh, it, it, would, it would take 
it would take a lot of time. <laughs> uh, it would take weeks and weeks. And once we came to those agreements, then there might be restaffing, rebus routing, re, uh, and it doesn't actually resolve for the issue of the third of families that want to continue staying at home this spring semester. So you might be able to get a few more kids into the classroom for a longer period of the day, but how do you maintain a continuity of learning and a stability of teaching for the third of our students, many of whom you know, have been impacted disproportionately, uh, who maybe want to come back to school, can't come back to school uh, for a number of really valid uh, reasons. So th those are just some of the realistic uh, constraints and variables. And so we welcome improved changes and conditions uh, in the community. Uh, and, and it's a good sort of signal uh, of the direction hopefully we'll be headed uh, and, and, you know, we'll have to discuss those. But I don't think that it's realistic that uh, for the remaining weeks of the fourth quarter uh, that we would suddenly um, uh, have the time sufficient to bargain and re-engineer all the logistical details that, that go into this. Uh, Dr. Byrne, any thoughts? Yeah, also, I, I mean, in, in addition to those things, we have over 3,000 classrooms in our school district that we have uh, rearranged for furniture. Some of that furniture is readily available in the school, but much of it has been moved to storage. So to reset those classrooms with additional desks, I mean, that is not something that happens overnight. So, uh, you know, the, there are operational um, uh, challenges to this as well as, uh, and uh, in addition to bargaining. So the bargaining agreement that we have now that it's been ratified is for the this school year and any changes to that, we would have to go back to the table for impact bargaining. I just want to say, um, you know, the the CDC guideline change is an important change across the country for our students to be able to have more access to education. That being said, I think um, a pilot project in a, in effect with um, fewer kids in the classroom and less burden of potential infectious uh, particulate matter in the air, honestly, like makes a lot of sense to me. And so I. I would just advocate for making sure that we have the air circulation and purifying and all the things that you're doing and really taking this um, in a stepwise manner as already is happening because we don't know what's ahead. And we know that there are um, indications that a surge is coming. And we also know that the variant um, is you know, potentially passed within school buildings to multi-generational families, and we don't have everyone vaccinated yet. So I, I appreciate um, the CDC's changes, but I also am honestly relieved to hear that PPS isn't going to try to change on a dime and that we're going to continue with the six feet. And I know that there are people out there, I've heard from many of my constituents who really would be frustrated by my saying that. But after talking to many public health officials and knowing that this is airborne, um, I think that this is, you know, a, a good middle ground, and I support um, the work that you're doing and the thought that we're putting into it, and um, a well-planned, executed um, education space feels better to me than trying to um, bring something together at the last second um, to, to adjust. So um, I'm fully in support, and I really am grateful um, for that. Uh, so Peter, go ahead. I'm sorry. I know that I just interjected again. I was gonna say, I know that you had a question um, regarding testing and tracing. I feel like this kind of fits into that um, discussion of, of safety. Yeah, so, you know, my lens that I'm gonna to bring to this is really my COVID-19 concern. And um, so I, I do want to, you know, understand the resources that the schools will have or the, the district will have as well as what you need. Um, we absolutely will need testing and tracing capability, especially knowing that um, the B117 variant can pass amongst children. And so what are you feeling like you're ready? Do you feel like you you have all the resources you need? And, and if not, like, how can I help um, in that regard? So we have, uh, we're in the process, our each principal uh, registers for the testing program that's uh, provided by OHA. We're in the process of acquiring those testing kits, those Abbott, uh, rapid tests that we'll be using for symptomatic uh, students. And then we do have uh, contact tracing procedures in place. So uh, anybody that comes into our building has to sign in. And uh, so we have you know, controls about who is coming in. 
uh, and you know where they're going. That's why the cohorting is so important that uh, you know we know exactly who's who is where, and uh, we have um, symptom spaces set aside for in our buildings to uh, uh, monitor students who are not feeling well or or faculty members who are not feeling well. Uh, but we are going to be implementing the uh, the testing program as as um, outlined by the OHA. And uh, it, that is um, will be new to us, obviously. So uh, we'll we'll see how that uh, how that develops over time. I don't know if you want to add something, Superintendent? Great, thank you. All right, and we have time for a couple more questions. Um, so one question that we've received is how is the change to a hybrid model going to impact the um, lunches and meal programs that the district has been so um, valiant on in terms of you know providing these um, lunch, these you know meals to students yeah we will continue to provide meal service to students uh, what will change now is all of our kitchens will essentially be open because every school is open so um, there is uh, easier access in some ways uh, right now we have uh, about 40 sites i think that are uh, meal distribution uh, hubs we also deliver uh, using our transportation system uh, but now all of our kitchens will be reopening and students who come to school will be able to grab uh, grab and go service for uh, those students to take their lunch if they're in the morning and plus their breakfast uh, for the next day. And the same is true for the afternoon, it'll be breakfast and lunch for the next day. So uh, students who are not coming to school, we're uh, developing those plans for uh, those students who are staying home or what, what time they would come. Because again, we wanna make sure that there is uh, sufficient um, time for our staffs to, uh, for our custodial staff to clean the buildings, also to limit the number of people that are coming into buildings. We don't want people uh, mixing, you know, we need to make sure uh, students that leave and then there's some time for students who need to come to get food to be able to do that so that we have some uh, distance in there. But we're uh, establishing those uh, those schedules and we'll be communicating those to families uh, very shortly. But the, the meal service will not uh, be interrupted at all. Great. And the last question that we have is with regards to if the district is planning or looking at ways of kind of continuing this hybrid model post COVID, you know, once we get over this in terms of, you know, many students have succeeded in this um, kind of hybrid model. And if the district is considering looking at what, you know, a fall, assuming everything is going as planned, um, may look like um, and, and, you know, going forward. That's a great question. I, I think we've learned a lot during this pandemic. And one of them is how powerful technology can be as a tool or as a platform. As challenging as, as it has been for a lot of students and families, we've also heard reports directly that for some, this has actually been a better medium for them. Uh, for whatever reason, they've enjoyed sort of the, the independent management of a more personalized learning plan virtually. And uh, we've always had students that have preferred that kind of a model in Portland Public Schools. We've, we've had a virtual scholars model, for instance, where students take their coursework online and check in with an educator uh, periodically. Uh, we are giving thought to, and we are already making plans for uh, expanding uh, our virtual scholars program, uh, particularly this summer for high school students who we wanna make sure stay on track and need to earn some credits. But it is having us think about, well, how do, how do we invest in this kind of an option uh, and expand on that kind of programming beyond just the typical high school credit recovery model? And so, uh, because there are students out there who just, you know, for whom they've actually thrived a bit more. Uh, and in some ways you'd think they might have grown more isolated or retreated, but in fact, uh, they're, they're appreciating the interface that, that the computer is providing. So, uh, what that looks like is, is sort of a question that has educators around the country sort of, you know, rethinking about, well, is there a role for a virtual or an online school option in K-12? Uh, I don't know sort of to what extent or what might be most age appropriate. I think it's a little harder for, say, a kindergartner to do a full-time virtual program uh, without some bit of uh, support. But, but maybe maybe it's middle school uh, we expand down to. Maybe it's the upper grades. I don't have a, a concrete answer, uh, but I know that our teaching and learning department and many others have sort of vocalized the same kind of question. Uh, is there a place for hybrid learning in the future? Um, 
it's hard to say until we get a little bit closer <laughs> in the end of the summer, whether that's even a necessary option that we may need to sort of account for. Uh, you know, what would it look like if, you know, in at a fifth grade at a school, if the four teachers in a particular grade level, three of them were in person and one was handling kids who, who were opting into a more of a distance or a hybrid uh, type of uh, program, you know, they're, they're all possible, uh, I guess, logistically, uh, but we don't have a concrete plan today around saying to families, a hybrid option will continue to be available to you in the fall semester. Uh, we're not there yet, but we're certainly giving some thought to it. Thank you. And I know, Vesna, this is something that's kind of hits close to home. I didn't know if you wanted to do a follow up on that. Yeah, I just want to, everything you answered mainly, mainly my question, but you know, I'm uh, like Maxine, I'm a, I'm a physician, I'm a family physician in the gateway community. So I have patients who are principals, who are custodians, who are students. Like, I feel like I've heard all sides. Plus, I'm also a mom of a 12-year-old with an IEP at PPS who has thrived in CDL. Mm -hmm. So um, I've really checked my privilege at the door and sort of let not been a part of this conversation at all and sort of let you guys figure things out. I think you've done a great job. I mean, I really have not been vocal at all, I've not gone to any meetings or anything. And I just wanna make sure that the parents like in my situation are having as loud of a voice as the parents who are all in, like, let's go back to normal. Because when I hear let's go back to normal being said, like the, my hair stands on end because normal wasn't great. You know, I mean, the classes are too crowded, et cetera, et cetera. My son did not thrive, you know. So I just want to make sure that if you're not, um, I am, I am motivated to reach out to the communities that I'm a part of, if that voice isn't loud, enough, if you're not hearing us enough, not to annoy you, but to let you know that this, there is this community and innovate so that we can have options in the fall. And that's all. Yeah, I think we would welcome the occasional reminder, but I'll assure you, we didn't go into this business because we're only thinking about some of our children or youth. We're thinking about every one of them. And I think that has been frustrating to some uh, factions of the community who have strong viewpoints, maybe are a bit more organized and vocalizing those opinions. Uh, I'm not in this work because I think it's a popularity contest. So I'm always thinking about every one of our children, especially those that are being disproportionately impacted. I'm in no rush to go back to what was because I'm very clear that wasn't serving everybody. And so this is an opportunity to reimagine our school system to, to create a more expanded view on what's possible. Our students with disabilities, uh, our immigrant students, um, you know, many uh, our black and native youth, uh, you know, they, we, we've been doing better with them, uh, but perhaps this is another opportunity to engage in some dialogue with those uh, focus groups in those communities to say, are there any aspects here we should try to hold on to and incorporate as we think about uh, reopening? I think you're right, back to normal is not a good way to put it. Um, uh, and, and public ed as a, as a model hasn't evolved a whole lot over the last couple hundred years. Uh, this could be one of those disruptions that, that gives us permission to be more creative. That, that better meets the needs of, of our students. Thank you so much. Um, and I, I know that there are a couple um, chats uh, going on with Facebook and here, and I just wanted to ask before we do the, or maybe you can include it in your closing comments, um, what is different about the um, school environment now? I know that there's more school nurses, more counselors, you know, that there's been a shift in those supports for students. And so I know I'm seeing that some folks would like to understand what that looks like. So I uh, give you the floor to, to make your closing comments. And if you touch on that too, that would be great. Thank you. Sure, and I'll let Dr. Bird sort of have the last word here. One thing that's been important to us and applying a, a more equity-centered lens to our work is how do we differentiate, uh, in particular for our underserved school communities? And I think you see evidence over the last couple budget cycles, our resource management should reflect those values. And so you've seen us, you know, even before this pandemic even hit the streets, we had already uh, started to make deeper investments in social workers and counselors and direct student services to students. I'm also a champion for the arts and many schools in our district didn't have access to visual and performing arts. You know, uh, every school should have a commensurate array of opportunities and experiences available 
to our students. So we've been inventorying. We have a pretty clear spreadsheet about what schools have what, uh, and we have been filling in those goal, those gaps pretty aggressively. And then there's another aspect that maybe not everybody appreciates, but we've been over-resourcing a lot of our poorer schools who don't have the, the capital or the means perhaps within their school community, uh, who also are deserving of, of an equitable level of conditions and experience uh, in, in, in their schools. So we, we've tried to make a very conscious effort in, in that regard to, uh, to make sure that uh, that's in place. Uh, and we do have some state designated uh, schools who uh, for historical, uh, trends, you know, haven't haven't produced uh, the outcomes that, that we would hope every one of our our students uh, is being afforded the opportunity to. So we're also putting in in place some supports and interventions there as well. Uh, but Dr. Bird, uh, he oversees our portfolio of schools and the team of supervisors who 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 support our principals and our schools. And this is the daily conversation that we engage in. What are the what's the customized school improvement plan? What else do they need? Maybe this school doesn't have a foundation, but there are many other ways that we're supporting that school with additional teaching staff or, or support staff or community partnerships that can provide wraparounds to some of our culturally specific student populations. Sean? Yep, so we definitely have added over the years more counselors and social workers. So we have uh, many more of those available in our buildings that will uh, we'll, we'll be relying on as, as students return to school. Um, we have uh, in our most uh, underserved uh, communities, we have added uh, reading specialists, math specialists, uh, different. Uh, we've added additional administrative support in those schools. So we really try to look at the school's uh, need and then staff them uh, appropriately based on the needs that they have. But I know one of the things that many people are concerned about is the social emotional issues that uh, students have been having as, as they've been away from school. And so we're ready for that. We have um, We'll be devoting some time each day for uh, some of those kinds of check-ins that uh, teachers are doing those now online, but there'll be, uh, you know, a renewed focus on that uh, in our buildings. And you know, social emotional learning is not something that just is a is a separate thing. It should be woven into the to the daily uh, routine of a school, and that's all about building community and building uh, our relationships in our classrooms. And so that's why it is really critical that we. Um, get kids in, back in school and we get them uh, into some sort of a routine. So uh, the whole basis of our uh, hybrid model, uh, you know, all of, every model has constraints, but what we wanted to do is provide as much routine and stability for students as we could, as they sort of enter uh, back into the school for the last um, year. We, we, want, we want to celebrate the seniors who are graduating this year and their accomplishments over the, the last 13 years. This is not the way they uh, dreamed of ending their uh, school year, I'm sure. And we want to get those kindergartners who've never been in school. Uh, we want to get them into a, and ready to, to uh, take off and, and be successful for the next 13 years. So we're really excited to welcome our kids back. Uh, our teachers are really excited to welcome their students back. And um, we look forward to a safe return. We've spent a lot of uh, time and energy on uh, creating safe environments in our schools. It will look a little different. There'll be some distance. People will be wearing masks. Uh, but we need to keep everybody safe and and um, and that's what we have spent the last several months uh, focusing on so uh, we look forward to seeing our youngest kids on april 1st and 2nd and then um you know our older kids on a return after that april 5th for second through fifth and april 19th for our uh, high school students I'm all, i also just would like to point out that we have had over 4,000 students have been participating at the high school level in athletics and so that's been very successful since October. I know your son was playing baseball this morning. So, uh, we, you know, and we've added fine arts programs into that. So we've had kids come back. We're just looking to now uh, even have more students come back and, and bring some more routine to, to their lives, which we know that they, uh, that lots of kids do need and thrive on. So uh, we look forward to seeing everybody soon. So thank you for the time today. No, thank you so much. And I know that we had quite a few people watching on, on Facebook Live and, and we had lots of folks submitting questions. And so I think we had a pretty good uh, representation, but this is going to be an ongoing conversation. And so I really look forward to um, checking in, hopefully um, after school gets going and see um, how that is and, and communicate whatever we can to, to my constituents. Um, I do wanna just let people know that the importance of vaccination is top of mind right now. And, you know, there's there's concerns about the vaccine. I can just reinforce that they're safe. The um, side effects are, are usually very modest and, and when they're not, they're short-lived. 
um, we have got to get our communities of 60 and older vaccinated. And that is fundamental to keeping our schools open. Um, if there are outbreaks um, and those are causing illness, that will cause disruption to learning. And so as a community, I think we all are aligned around wanting our kids to be back in school. There are so many people who really want that. And also those of us who just want the rhythm of school to, to finally kind of um, be sustained. I think the disruption of getting back and then having to quit, that, that sounds like even worse to me in quite in a lot of ways. So um, please, everyone know that you are eligible for a vaccine if you're 65 and older right now. Um, on May 20 or March 29th, it will open um, to those with comorbid illnesses. And, um, and I believe it's 40 to 65 um, in that age group. And then also if you are a, an agricultural worker, um, seasonal worker, um, or a wildfire um, worker, mostly because those folks are going to be at work soon and, and they need time to get vaccinated and, and um, protected. And then May 1st, all adults 16 and older. So that includes our high school community. And so um, I, you know, my daughter's a senior in high school and we talked about this um, this weekend that it's going to be a really great opportunity for our high school students to, to stay safe through the rest of, of the school year and into the extended part of the summer. And that's the last thing I wanted to say is as a legislator, I am so excited about the funding that we have for sustained and robust um, summer programming. And so many families need that relief at this time and, and that semblance of normalcy and getting our kids you know, engaged and social and outdoors. So um, I know PPS is going to be really central in that and, and our leadership in the legislature is really excited about all the opportunities there. So um, this is just the beginning of, I think, you know, the true spring and there's lots of hope and we just need to make sure that we stay safe and stay calm as things are, are not gonna be perfect. So be graceful with one another and, and understand we're all doing our best and keep letting me know what you need. And, and I will continue to be in contact with our districts and, and thank you both for being here and for sharing your information this morning. Thank you for having us, Representative Dexter. Yep, take care. All right, I think that I'll end it. I will also quickly flag that we will be hosting a town hall this Wednesday, the March 24th from 5 to 6 p.m. with County Commissioner Sharon Myron and Portland City Commissioner Mingus Maps to talk about public safety in the Pearl District. Um, I'll put the link to RSVP for that in the chat. And also, if you have any more questions, or want to stay updated with COVID-19, you can check out the uh, COVID-19 subcommittee that Representative Dexter is the chair of. All right, thank you so much. Alicia, did you have questions? <laughs> uh